everyone, and welcome to the Podcast by Army podcast, where we talk about BTS, Army, fandom, and research. We are your co-hosts, Dr. Kate Ringland and... Gerta Her, a university researcher. Ooh. And today we're talking about research. Yay! Yeah, R E A S E A R. <laughs> oh no. Can you tell that I got out in the first round of the spelling bee <laughs> in elementary school? <laughs> got all the letters right. They were just not <laughs> quite the right order. Yeah. Did you know, Kate? I actually don't know how to spell words, I just sound them out whenever i can't sound like, words. i don't know i'm like the worst i'm the worst at spelling i have to, i'm i am so glad that we now live in an era where there's spell check because it did not exist when i was a youth i had to write my high school essays by hand with a dictionary with a freaking dictionary and my teachers all threw me out of the class because i'm just like can't spell words because i can't I'm i don't so sorry <laughs> yeah like the whole hooked on phonics thing did not work for me. Here we are. I write for a living. I literally write for a living. Here we are. Congratulations. You're here. <laughs> All right. Let's jump into it, Kate. Like, how did you get into research? Research. Yeah. So I spent my 20s not sure what I was doing with my life. Um, I worked on undergraduate degrees in psychology and computer science. And I did not want to get professions in either of those things after I graduated because they both sounded like terrible pathways. I didn't want to go into clinical psych and I didn't want to go just code for some computer company making software or whatever. I, on a whim, applied for a summer research internship and got it. And so then I spent the summer before I graduated, I spent at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, where I did research with folks with visual impairments. And so I was doing, I was building tech for them and did a bunch of work and did research. So fast forward, then I decided I'm going to, I'm going to apply to grad school and keep doing this research thing because this seems pretty cool. I get to use all the things I've learned from my psychology and my computer science degrees and I get to actually make things that help other people. So I got into the PhD program at UC Irvine and spent my whole PhD career, like the my whole grad school experience, doing research around tech for autistic folks. And that translated into to talking about Minecraft and games for autistic kids. Anyway, so long story short, I got into research partly because I didn't really want to just be the person that was making things. I wanted to be the person that was designing and creating the things that were going to help people. And I really wanted to be the person who was helping communities and helping people, especially as I went, continued on my journey and I became more involved in my own neurodivergent and disability communities, I wanted to do work that was actually going to help them and support them in the ways that they wanted to be helped and support and not in the ways that other people thought they should be. Fairly altruistic, but I, I really got into research because I wanted to help people. And um, then it turns out that doing that work is really hard and it's really easy to burn out, which we've talked about in other episodes about burnout. And so fast forward to now, I've decided to really lean into working with the communities that mean something to me personally and to do research that is going to help the people in my spaces and in my communities. And so that's how I ended up here. What was a monologue? <laughs> no, but it's nice. It's good. I've never heard about this from you either. So I'm just listening and absorbing what you're talking about it's honestly nice to hear where you come from because I guess I'll get into it like my background is I'm an undergraduate a second year undergraduate by the way mm. so I have not been in academia for a long time but I've been in fandom for a long time and I've been yeah. in, interested in academia for a long time so I think it was around like 11 or 12 when I discovered not discovered but I like stumbled upon academic papers mm -hmm. by people like Henry Jenkins who yeah. is my hero 
and I'll say that on podcast that did, <laughs> that man started it all for me if I'd never found his papers and his work I would not be here today that's just straight up and I found his work and that's where I found fandom academia or aka fandom and then that's where I also found fandom meta so fandom meta is like analyzing fandom there's like a huge community a fandom meta essayist on tumblr live journal even reddit who do a lot of stuff like that so i was very involved in that because i did a lot of fandom meta on shipping which <laughs> i don't know we might talk about shipping more in the context of this podcast and our fandoms currently in the future but for me shipping was like a celebration of love it was very in tune with kind of like my queer journey as well as a person Mm -hmm. and just being able to read papers that adults because I was like what 12 13 at this time (laughs) papers that adults wrote about like in my head like the the responsible cool adults they wrote (laughs) about shipping and then they presented it to other adults and that was like revolutionary in my head so it was very impactful to read this kinds of things and have fandom be validated. And then I have a whole, I read a, I wrote a whole Medium article about my journey in fandom and ending up here today with Kate and the Misfit Lab. But you can go read that. I'm not going to reiterate the whole thing here. But <laughs> I struggled a lot with kind of coming to terms with having this passion for fandom because I come from an Asian household and there's a lot of expectations to like normal go to college, make money type of life. And, but now that I'm older, I've come to terms. I I really believe in fandom and I really believe fandom has such richness to it in culture that can help benefit the rest of society as well. And I really want to invest in researching fandom and validating fandom. So yeah, that's why I'm here today with Kate. Yay! I think you make an interesting point, though, because I think that they're like in the la- in the sense of the larger academic conversation and the larger academic community. I think that spaces like fandom often get dismissed, and I have been struggling with this, like on a personal level, for the last what three years or whatever. Basically, since I've started doing research with my army community is the kind of larger academic sphere has really been dismissive of the work and really dismissive of the space. And I think it's interesting because it's not like these communities aren't made of people, right? There it's valid places where people are coming together as a community, doing community oriented things, using the technology around them, like doing all the things that we care about and study in these spaces. And I think it's really interesting how because it's oh that's just a hobby or it's just for fun or whatever it is that turns these people off there's just it's a very dismissive attitude and it's been a it's been a bigger hurdle than I was imagining trying to get people to take this work seriously and that might be partly because I'm trying to publish in computer science oriented spaces but it's okay okay I think (laughs) what you're doing is very admirable though pushing fandom and spaces where fandom is not accepted because it is true that these are like legit communities of people a lot of times people I don't know sometimes when I talk about fandom face-to-face with people Mm. the physical space right not online people have such it it really comes down to misogyny that's why I've understood it fandom is made up of thousands potentially millions of people yeah and there's people who do really good work here we talk about army all the time and army does amazing even right now one in an army is raising money for the nam june birthday drive and they got a thousand dollars in the first day over a thousand that's that's there's nothing that can compare to that that type of power that type of community togetherness and and community work and there's also other fandoms that do that too there was a i believe i think it's called fandom for the future or something like that it, it used to be a Harry Potter fandom donation drive mm-hmm. thing, a donation drive thing, but they changed their name because J.K. Rowling is transphobic. Right. We're, okay, I'm a part of the J.K. Rowling hate club. We hate her. 
She sucks. I acknowledge that Harry Potter. Okay, do you let this be on the podcast? <laughs> You're the one saying it. I happen to agree with you. So okay, I... we'll just leave it in. I am a part of the. I am part of the J.K. Rowling hate club. Uh, she's transphobic. She's a horrible person. I acknowledge that Harry Potter has helped a lot of people, and the Harry Potter fandom, amazing people, incredible, yeah. creative, driven, wonderful people in the Harry Potter fandom. J.K. Rowling, on the other hand, total piece of work. Just yeah. the worst. The so worst. Yeah. We hate her. But the fandom has done amazing things. So it, it's really interesting to see how in so many spaces, fandom is just not acknowledged, is pushed to the side, and people treat fandom as if it's this hobby or this side thing. Even with my life, like when I meet people in real life, people treat me liking BTS as a side thing. They're yeah. like, okay, so you like BTS and that's the one thing, right? And it's just to the side. It's if I talked about, oh yeah, I I like Pepsi. They treat it like that. Yeah. It's it's not even like significant to my life, but no, BTS are like a part of my life. That is a community I engage with. I talk to every day. And I don't know, how do you feel about that, Kate? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. I I think it's, I find it really frustrating. I either get... When I talk to people about BTS, and especially in the context of the work I do, I get three reactions. The first is they are also into BTS, so they get excited. So we'll leave that we'll leave that reaction aside. But the Yay. other two reactions are from people who don't know BTS. One, they're completely dismissive, like you just said. They're just like, oh, that's nice. And then they move on and they don't really, they don't even, their brains will not even engage. They just don't care. And you don't want to hear any more about it. They're just like, that's nice, moving on. Or they get really angry. Just out of the blue, very angry. And I've had multiple people respond that way. And the only thing I have to explain it is misogyny and xenophobia and racism. That's all I got. Because it's truly astounding how intense these reactions are, right? And these are people that otherwise I would have deemed perfectly normal people (laughs) that I interact with in other ways and in other spaces. But in this particular regard, they get very intense. Yeah, I can agree with that as well, that the particular anger that people unleash when you tell them that you like BTS is, it's, again, it's there's, it's so baffling. Yeah. I genuinely can't put my finger on why it is that intense and that just out of the blue yeah because there's some people i've told that i like bts and then they have a very adverse reaction where they're like oh are you crazy or like why do you like them it's like that disgust and oh my god i don't know what to do with it kate i don't know what to do either and i literally am studying this for my job and i like literally don't know what to do with it because it's just usually I am fairly good at getting to the bottom of like why a person is reacting a certain way. I like to think one of my skills as a person in the world is that I am pretty good at sussing those things out so that we can meet somewhere. And I tend to try to be the bridge between things or whatever, and to get people to accommodate or make compromises or whatever. But when I met with that reaction, I literally don't know what to do because there's no talking them out of it. There's no rationality and logic are like out the window because they're having this such an intense visceral emotional reaction and I just don't understand it and it gets really hard when I'm sitting here I'm just trying to be an academic writing a paper and you're having this reaction to my academic writing and I'm just and they can't see past that and it's really on the one hand it's horrible and awful and it's making my job really hard but also I find it from the perspective of trying to understand human behavior I find it fascinating that this is like how people are having this reaction yeah this is the hill you're choosing to to be mad about to get (laughs) so worked up people get really worked up about it really worked up yeah it's it's so strange yeah I do not think that I have ever, like, even being, like, an Asian person, I've, okay, I've experienced hate crimes. I've experienced people yeah. calling me Asian, like, slurs yeah. and very horrible things. Yeah. But I don't think I've ever experienced such intense anger like that. 
before when talking about BTS. It's people don't view hatred of BTS, irrational hatred of BTS as racism or xenophobia. They just think, oh, I just like this pathetic boy band or whatever. And they don't recognize that, no, this is a deeper issue. Right. (laughs) Right. It's, yeah. It's intense. Yeah, but to bring it back to the topic of this podcast. Bring it back um, to the topic. <laughs> yeah, we're here now. We do research for BTS. We're part of the Misfit Lab. Yeah. And do you want to give people context of why it's named that? If you go to misfit-lab.com, you can read about the context of the name. No, we there is a really great theory written by Rosemary Garmelin Thompson, who's a, a disability researcher. And this theory is the theory of misfitting, where basically the world is built for a certain kind of body and certain kinds of interactions. And if you are disabled, for example, then your body doesn't quite fit. So there's this idea of misfitting. Stairs, for example, is like a really obvious example of stairs are built for people with normative bodies that can walk upstairs. And if you're a wheelchair user, then you don't quite fit because you can't use the stairs that's a really simplified example but anyways so we're the misfit lab because we're thinking about the different ways that people aren't normative so like people aren't just the average body or the average way to think or the average way to be and interact in the world we think about how people don't fit and why our technology and our environments are built for not them (laughs) yeah our lab has our lab is relatively very diverse yeah we have a lot of people from a lot of different disciplines and backgrounds Mm -hmm. coming together to talk about research and in our lab we have this conversation a lot as well about i think it's marginalization yeah yeah Yeah. do you want to expand on that more yeah so we think a lot a lot of most of the work we do in our lab center around centers around these ideas of folks that are marginalized or minoritized in different ways. I, so speaking from my upbringing, if you will, as a researcher, I spent a lot of my formative years really doing deep dives into disability, critical disability studies. I'm going to use these keywords that are going to trigger people and I'm sorry, but like critical disability studies, critical race studies, queer studies. So like all these, like all the marginalizations you can think of, I did a lot of deep dive diving into the different readings. And so a lot of the way I think and approach the world is really owed to a lot of the scholars in these spaces. So a lot of people of color, a lot of queer scholars, a lot of disabled scholars. So thinking about, I have a whole, I have a whole reading list on my website that maybe I'll try to link somewhere. But anyway, so yeah, so I, I have this background in thinking about the ways in which marginalized folks have to approach the world in order to survive it especially for people where the world is not built for them or it's built to oppress them or do violence against them and so on and I should say that in our lab so I sit primarily in the discipline of human computer interaction so I'm thinking about how we build technologies how we use technologies and in terms of people and in terms of of their ways of interacting and being in the world I think a lot about things like access. Is the technology we're building and designing, is it giving access to people and who's being left out and why are they being left out? I tend to to be in a lot of conversations around thinking about who isn't in the room when we're having these conversations, who isn't privileged enough to be able to contribute to these conversations. And that's why I go for like really diverse set of people in my lab and try to invite lots of different disciplines and lots of different kinds of students because I want all those different people at the table when we're having these conversations and that's why I really love to kind of transition for us here that's why I really love doing this kind of community-based work so a lot of the work we do all the different projects we have going on the lab have community components to them so it's not just us sitting in our ivory tower thinking deep thoughts or whatever we're actually out in the communities talking to them seeing what they have to say figuring out how we can take what they're saying and actually move forward and, sh- and make a difference in the world. Yeah, I love our lab so much. And I, 
it's fun. Also, you talking about all this stuff makes me think about our lab. The majority of the projects in our lab is about building things. Yeah. And even all the projects I'm a part of, I'll touch on it very lightly. We'll just graze over it just to not uh-huh. spoil anything for the future. <laughs> but I build a lot of things yeah. with different project groups. And it it really is this ethos of the lab that keeps me here as well. Because just a side note as well, I initially came into college wanting to be a psychology major. And now I'm going to change my major to cognitive science so mm. I can do more coding and more actual science-y linguistic stuff mm-hmm. um, so I can go forward and build things because yeah. of this lab and my experience in this lab. And how because I learned that psychology isn't what I wanted it to be. <laughs> this I can relate to having also gotten a degree in psychology. I can deeply relate yeah. to this fact. <laughs> because psychology, not to paint a broad brush to the subject either, but psychology, from my perspective of what I've seen in college so far, it very much feels like sitting in the ivory tower. It doesn't feel like it's going out and building things. And I feel like Cognizance, HCI, where I am now with the Misfit Lab, that's where I want to be. And that's where I want to build and continue learning. So thanks, Kate. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I know where I am in the world. Wow. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, and also to bring back to when we're talking about diversity in the lab, there's also something very interesting about our lab as well, where we we try to break down research and talk about decolonizing research. Ah, yes. Yeah, no, I, so like I said, a lot of my the background of what I'm interested in terms of research is doing community-based work and doing it in ways that are supportive and accessible to the communities I'm working with. And especially if I'm working with marginalized communities or minoritized communities, I have to think about the kinds of methods we're using and the kinds of ways in which we are analyzing the data and writing about the data and getting the data back out into the world in a way that's useful to people. And one of the really interesting things, interesting, you know, oh, that's depressing sort of way. But one of the interesting things is thinking about a lot of the methods we use, and especially in HCI, in the field that I sit in, we borrow everything. We don't have our, not really, there's not really a lot of methods we claim as our own that originated with us. We just borrow methods from everyone else which is cool and fun, except that often when that happens, we forget to check the history of said methods. We forget to think about the ramifications of the things that might happen after using said methods. For example, I consider myself an ethnographer. I do a lot of, I use a lot of methods that come from anthropology and sociology. And I have to be really careful because those methods come from a very colonial space a very much we are the white person going into these other places and treating the communities there as other and so it's really easy to just fall into the trap of continuing that trend and so we do a lot of work in the lab of thinking about and talking about we talk a lot in this lab talking a lot about how to decolonize those methods how to Use those methods in a way that isn't going to be harmful or othering to the communities that we're working with. Especially, it becomes especially tricky when we're talking about, say, working with a community like ARMY, where I'm a member researcher, so I'm a member of this community, but I'm on obviously not the shining example of what a community member looks like, because we are so diverse and have so many different kind of intersecting identities. It's really important to make sure that we are approaching the community in a way that isn't going to be harmful to subsets of the community. Yeah, because even within within any fandom space, colonization, very prevalent. We have a lot of armies from places like India, super colonized by the British. And it's those Mm -hmm. effects are still felt by a lot of Indian armies today. And there's a lot of conversations by Indian armies about that. And even talking to K-armies in South Korea and how the U.S. is still actively colonizing South Korea. 
Right. There are military bases, which basically act as American cities in South Korea. And colonization is very present in our lived world right yeah. now. And in order to research about army, or just even, even I think just for us to even approach research and just like even entertaining the idea of research when it yeah. comes to army, you need to talk about colonization yeah. and how to decolonize well decolonization is never a truth you'll never truly be decolonized but how do we make this how do we how do we improve the methods that we use to be more in tune with how this community works and the struggles of this community and not come in like a vulture or treat people like how a lot of armies like say academics treat them like guinea pigs and that moves into another conversation we're gonna have today like relationship with army take it away kate Woo! yes i became army in, and i know i've told this story already but i'm gonna give the cliff note version for people who are don't remember anyways i became army mid 2020 in the middle of the pandemic when life was falling apart and i needed bts and they were there and it was beautiful I didn't join Army Twitter until January of 2021, mostly because I was terrified of Army Twitter. And it took many people basically telling me it was going to be okay. <laughs> and I wasn't going to die immediately upon entry. Um, that's, a, that's another conversation. But yeah, so I finally joined Army Twitter in January of 2021. And I had already basically shifted the last half of 2020. I was like, okay, this army thing is a big deal. There's a lot going on here. I might just shift my whole research focus to talk about this community because it's doing really great things. I had already at that point thought, okay, I'm going to do something with this because I had seen a lot of army on TikTok. There was a lot of really cool community stuff happening there. And then I got on Twitter and I was like, oh my God, this is where the community is actually happening. It blew my mind and, and sent me on this path. I partially was like, I was already studying social media and play and marginalized communities. And it just really fit my research agenda and my ethos as a person. And I really needed that change in order to like get out of that burnt out feeling I was having from doing my previous research. I got on army Twitter and I was very transparent. So this is like one of the interesting things about how I do my work. And I'm, I don't necessarily advocate for this being the only way to do this kind of work, but I'm going to say, this is what I've done. And I've been developing these methods and developing how I do research for the past 10 years. It's really been 10 years. Wow. So a decade of this work. And so I'm not going to say this would work for everyone in every community, but this is what's worked for me. So I immediately upon entry in Twitter, I was very transparent about who I was and what I was doing there. So I was very much, I am an academic. I do research. I am going to be doing research in this space. I have a really long, intricate way of conducting myself ethically which some of it is outlined on twitter if you're interested in backlogging to my tweet threads and stuff but mostly to say that i am fairly open but also very careful about who i am taking data from and how i'm using that data etc cetera, etc cetera. i do a lot of observational work and a lot of interaction and interviewing and i do some surveys and that's it for my methods so we're not doing any experiments. What else should I qualify here? We don't do experiments. We don't test we're things. Not like, yeah, we're not making anybody like little, especially without their consent, we're not turning anyone into test subjects. We're literally just like being in the community and being like, hey, we're here and that's what we're doing. Yeah. Between January and through March, things were fairly okay. And I was just getting my feet under me. I the the one of the things I'll say about the methods I use is they're very involved and that they take a long time, which is not normal for tech-related, computer-related research areas. Things tend to happen very fast. Like they build a thing, they break it, they see what happens, and they move on. But for three months, I mostly was just observing and interacting and just being a person in the space. I wasn't doing a lot of scholarly things at that point. 
I, I you try to get my feet under me anyway. And then the first big kerfluffle, which we have talked about in a previous podcast, happened. I think it was the first episode we talked about. That. Very bold. And that of us. was in April. So I was basically there, and I got there mid January, and then not four months later, academics were canceled on Army, and it was a little alarming. Oh be real it was a little alarming watching like all of academia get canceled by the community but i will say that i felt like a lot of the concerns about what academics were doing and still are doing were valid and i think that's the tldr here is that army have a very tenuous strained basically non-existent relationship with academics because academics tend to exploit and behave badly with the community academics behave badly and next we're going to talk about how they behave badly do you want to do that so like I said earlier, we do in this lab, we do community-based work. So we're like very intent and intentional about how we work with communities and often as people who are a part of those communities. So it becomes extra important that we do this well. But I maintain that even if you're not a member of this, of a community, you can still do this work well. So I will throw that out, out there as a caveat. I think that there's difference between whether you're a member researcher, somebody who's a member of the community versus a non-member researcher. I think that there are pros and cons to both. And so I don't necessarily need to argue here about one, neither is better than the other necessarily. But I do think that especially working in communities who are particularly exploited by academia and who are particularly minoritized or marginalized by society i think it's really important to have a membership perspective when you're doing the work like the first thing that happens often with academics who are doing research on or studying or i don't even whatever you want to call it doing research on army or bts tend to do it from an outsider perspective. So they tend not to know anything about the community that they're talking about. They tend to, and obviously I am generalizing here, but it is the majority, I will say that confidently, that the majority of researchers who have written about BTS and ARMY have done so very confidently without actually knowing much about the community at all. And you can see this as a member of the community, you can read these papers and can tell right off the bat the way the language they use, the way they talk about themselves in relation to the community. You can tell right off the bat that they don't actually belong in the community. They're not actually a participant in the community. Yeah, to me, I don't understand how, as an academic, how one could be so confident about making claims about a community without actually knowing them. I don't understand how that's just not good research. How do you make a claim about a community without actually having a deep understanding of that community? I, you can't. That's the fact. That's why that's there's the so much answer. like BTS army research. That's just, even K-pop research itself. Yeah. So bad. Like the yeah. way we wouldn't call ourselves K-pop researchers, we're yeah. ARMY. Yeah. ARMY first, researchers second. Yeah. But again, ARMY researchers. We're, we only really care about ARMY and understanding ARMY in relation to fandom and like that. Yeah. But I've read K-pop academic papers and essays before, and a lot of them just lack nuance or yeah. understandings of these fandoms. Like I understand these are international fandoms. A lot of different languages, a lot of different things going on all the time. But these people come into these spaces and they write about these fandoms and they just know nothing. And then in turn, that hurts us as well because BTS gets labeled as K-pop. Again, we've had this conversation, but it just happens again and again that 
as researchers, we do something very distinctly that is not K-pop. We're focusing on ARMY, right? Yeah. But we get lumped in and we yep. just get all of this weird stuff going on. It's very strange. Actually, from a fandom perspective as well, from a fandom meta perspective, I can say this. Mm -hmm. It is particularly strange that so many people who do K-pop research, I'll just generalize here, K-pop research, mm -hmm. just don't know anything about K-pop or don't know K-pop in depth. They don't have a breadth of information about K-pop. If you look at academia for other fandoms, in particular, there is some research about hockey fandoms right now and how they're tied to fan fiction. It's actually very interesting. Mm -hmm. But that academic work is being done by people who know about those communities, who understand the history of how those communities are forming and, and what's behind them. I challenge anyone who's listening to this right now, if you look at academic research about fandom, like other fandoms, like pick any fandom you're also a part of or just something you're interested in, Twilight fandom, Twilight Saga, or Minecraft YouTubers, or just like YouTubers in general too, like any type of academia like that. Look at that and compare it with K-pop academics and like the yeah. work they're doing. The information or like the the quality of information is drastic just like k-pop academia there's so much in k-pop academia but they're, they generalize a lot mm -hmm. or they like you talked about this they complete things like you want yeah. to talk about that yeah yeah there's uh, there's so much to unpack here but yeah a lot of what happens is all k-pop the giant umbrella of k-pop gets all conflated together and it feels like people doing k-pop research don't see it as fandom research so lots of things that happen in fandom in general kind of get lumped in with k-pop for people who are studying k-pop so and this happened in this article we were reading earlier this week where the author was talking very specifically about certain things that just happen in fandom in general but the author was labeling it as a k-pop phenomenon because they don't know anything about other fandom right and then on top of that then bts because bts is from korea and does popular music they then also get lumped into k-pop and if anybody knows anything about army the first thing we're going to be like if you're conflating us with k-pop then you don't belong here you shouldn't be talking about us get us out of your mouth and it's fascinating to see how that all those contexts collapse immediately when you start seeing these academic articles and it's super problematic super problematic yeah i agree with you on that it's like how you talked about these people don't understand that other fandoms also experience a lot of things that army is experiencing right they try to act like what we experience what we do is revolutionary there is a lot of things army does that's revolutionary but I don't think we want to say anything specific, too specific to refer to this author because right. they're whatever. But they are just an example, one of many. They're an example. Yes, that's the right word. They're an example of <laughs> the ridiculous comparison. There's one thing in particular this person did that very much made me have an ick or like an ew, where they talked about this. Let's just, I'm trying to be as vague as possible here, Kate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they talked about a feature on a website, a paid feature on a website. Yeah. And they talked about how that is contributing to parasocial relationships and the boyfriend, girlfriend narrative that a lot of companies try to push. And then they tried to link it that BTS was using that paid feature when BTS yep. don't even use it. Right. They... It was just sitting there at the end of that sentence. It was like, BTS, blah, blah, blah. And here's this paid feature. And I'm just like, whoa, we don't, we don't use that. We don't, that's not something we do here. And I hope we never do because wow, that's so unfortunate. <laughs> yes. It's very interesting they talked about that particular paid feature as well, but they didn't have any nuance or understanding of the paid features on other platforms. So it was that specific hone in 
to that feature and try and associate it with BTS. And it felt very malicious, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah. So there was just like a lot of that going on in this article, but the point of bringing this article up is to say that this is happening. You can find, you pick up any article, academic article about BTS and ARMY and eight, nine out of 10 times, it's going to have these weird issues in them where it's clearly the person has an interesting thing to say, maybe, but they, instead of getting nuanced and digging into the community and different aspects of the community, they just gloss over what the community actually is. And under, and they don't understand the community values. They don't understand how the community interacts with one another. They don't have any of the context that's actually needed to understand why particular phenomena or why particular things are important or interesting. And the other thing I'll say is that, and I had this moment on Twitter when I was thinking about, when I was reading this article, the problem with not having this nuance is then people pick the easiest thing to talk about. So with K-pop and BTS and different kind of thinking about these fandom spaces, not as fandom spaces, but as K-pop community spaces or whatever these academics are doing they tend to pick the easiest framework. So like thinking about capitalism, like obviously it's easy to just be like, ah, capitalism is to blame for everything that is happening in these communities. And I choose the word blame there very specifically because these articles and the the manuscripts tend to be fairly negative. They tend to have these negative views of what these communities are doing, how they're behaving slash misbehaving in their opinion. And a lot of it comes back to capitalism and the drive to make money and loses all the other context and nuance that's what's happening in these spaces. Yeah. That's so true. These people, they, it's like they try to throw in the word capitalism. So that way people like have a red flag in their head and they're like, oh, these fans contributing to ca- to capitalism, which there's a whole conversation to have about. There's fandom. a whole other conversation we could probably have about this. Yes. Yeah, and capitalism, and capitalism, and how there's a lot of companies that do exploit fans. Yeah. With capitalism, and there's times where Big Hit and Hive have overstepped themselves, and yeah. that we have disagreed with, and. But just in the context of this paper, they did it in such a way where it very intentionally tried to paint BTS's company as like this big evil corporation exploiting yeah. fans and the idols and in in the fandom space we call this a manti, a manager anti a perspective where someone wants to micromanage basically the members and like that and they want to say oh the company's bad and i could manage them better because i know better which if this person knew the fandom they would know about what a manti is yeah. but they don't and they never mention anything about it because yeah. they don't know about the fandom yeah. so thus their argument is now less nuanced than it could yeah. be my goodness I do think it's interesting kind of circling back to something you said we're talking about earlier about how we lose a lot of the nuance and context specifically when it comes to K-pop and perhaps even more specifically when it comes to BTS and ARMY. And I'm wondering if that kind of goes hand in hand with both the, it goes hand in hand with the idea that people in these communities are not adults. So the idea that the, that people in K-pop communities, K-pop fandoms, people in ARMY can't possibly speak for themselves, can't possibly write research papers for themselves because they're not even adults yet. Like that kind of pervasive narrative about everyone in K-pop fan- fandom being under the age of 18 or whatever. Okay, um, I have opinions on that. Keep going, but... Oh, I have so many opinions. So oh many. Irony of our podcast statistics... I know, I know. The fact that, what did I say earlier? 54% of our listeners are over the age of 34. Love that so much. Anyway, but yeah, so thinking about like, I could imagine a scholar being like, oh, I must talk about and represent these communities because they can't speak for themselves for X, Y, Z reasons. Giving white savior. Yeah, it's that kind of, yeah, that white saviorism gross. A lot of these, okay, side note as well. A lot of these scholars are indeed white. Yeah, it's true. Which I think, 
I know you're white as well, Kate. I am so white. It's true. <laughs> give to this conversation as well. A lot of these people come from white perspectives and want to save the fandoms or be this bright leader and light for the fandoms when yeah. we don't need that. Right. Super and don't need that. I don't know. Just this whole conversation kind of circles around these people. I don't want to paint too broad of a brush or make too many assumptions on this, but I really truly don't think these people have done anything, any type of deeper research into fan studies because right. people who are involved in fan studies know very intrinsically, just like it's bottom of the line kind of understanding that fandoms are very complex and multifaceted communities of people. And it is so interesting to see these people come into K-pop studies or coming into understand K-pop and try to do academic papers about K-pop. And they just have nothing about fan studies. It's right. I don't understand the separation of fan studies and K-pop. No, it's super bizarre. But I also think that the siloing is also partly because we also see both of those things being very siloed off from the rest of academia too. You don't see a lot of intermixing, which is why literally no one ever has written about BTS and ARMY or any K-pop that I know of in any of my HCI communities. There's literally two, two of us, three of us maybe, scholars that are doing work in this space and we've each published a couple of papers and that's it in our discipline for this kind of work. And it's fascinating to me because ARMY was literally making headlines for the kinds of numbers it was doing, kinds of interactions it was creating in 2020 for the different leveraging social media for social justice. Like all of that was making headlines and it's literally what we study in HCI. That's what, that's our bread and butter is trying to understand how large scale communities use social media platforms to do these kinds of things. And the fact that all of that kind of gets swept under the rug and dismissed is indicative of larger issues within academia. There's just larger issues of we're siloing these different communities in the hopes they don't talk to one another so that they can just keep to themselves so we don't have to deal with them. It's the vibe that I get. And you're so right about that vibe <laughs> because I see that as well. And I like understand that. And I've seen it my whole entire fandom career, like 10 plus years being in fandom, just like how it's so othering and it's very purposeful and it's yeah. othering. It, it's meant to discourage us from, because I know there's a lot of issues within fandom spaces that there's a lot of issue, larger issues that have happened that originated with a lot of fan communities coming together. Anything about internet laws in the past 15, 20 years. Probably a fandom has talked about it and gotten people to sign petitions. There's, what's it called? There's this child safety bill going on right now in Congress and it's like complete BS. But right. a lot of fandoms on Tumblr, on Twitter, circulating petitions, telling people to talk about it. I remember very recently too, I sent this to you, Kate, but there was a... You can make a comment basically about this AI about AI to right. I forgot what it was. It was I think it was the FCC. Yeah, to the FCC. You make a comment about AI and how it affects people. And a lot of fandoms, like fan artists, they were circulating that and they wanted people to talk about, hey, like we shouldn't use we shouldn't allow AI artworks to be sold for money. Right. Because that takes away from like actual work of actual artists. And like fandoms are legit groups of people doing amazing revolutionary work, a lot of activism, like so much activism. Like I always think about this, but there's specifically like fan fiction groups on Tumblr who like to do donation drives and raise money for different things, like different things they're fighting for. And they just do that. It's just something they do. It's just like a fact of life. It's just, oh, this month we're doing this, guys. And it's a fact of life. Or they write fan fiction and then in their author's notes at the end, they're like, hey, guys, this week, this month we're supporting this donation thing. Like, go support that. As you read my fan fiction about a bunch of people kissing and loving each other. <laughs> and then it's a ballerina AU and ice skaters and a bunch of random <laughs> stuff. Like, they like write like their fan fiction. And at the end, they promote something that they really love and support. And that is revolutionary work. That is yeah. 
what other community people on the internet can you think of that does that? I have a right? Really yeah, I can think of maybe gamers. A lot of gamers have started doing, this isn't started, this is more past 20 years. They yeah. did a lot of donation drives, right? There's you get child's play and stuff, you get whole charity balls, which yeah. is fantastic. And I, I often see gamers and fandoms as sitting at the same table. We're the same. Exactly. A gaming community is a fandom. Yeah. They just Sense. don't want to call themselves that. No, I, 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 yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole other podcast, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, we could talk about misogyny in the gaming community forever. <laughs> yes. But yeah, it's, it's just baffling. Just how fandom is treated. It's not legitimate. It's right. not, and it, it's purposeful too. It, it's like diminishing the power of fandoms, which is largely made up of people of color, yeah. marginalized people, queer people. And yeah. I hate it. <laughs> I hate it. <laughs> 10 years of my life, Kate. I hate it. Oh, yes. It's just, to me, it's just, it comes back to what we were saying at the very beginning of this podcast about how people have these ingrained visceral reactions to these things, right? They're like, they're just like automatic emotional responses. Ooh, this is about fandom. Let's disengage intellectually. It To me, it doesn't make sense. Like, why would you do that? But this is just because we're humans and I guess this is what we do. But I want to know as a researcher who wants to, I want to be able to write about my community and I want to be able to not only showcase some of these, like the things you were just talking about, some of the amazing things that ARMY does, right? That's why I'm here is partly, hey, this community isn't just this capitalist thing to be exploited or however people are viewing it right? This is a whole amazing, nuanced, complex, multifaceted community that is doing some really amazing work. I spent two years in a postdoc studying digital mental health, and they were struggling for most of my postdoc. They were struggling with this con this question of like, how do we get help out into communities? How do we reach people? How do we reach youth? How do we reach the those pe the people who fall through the cracks so the people that are often marginalized in many different ways or they're the folks in their they're in their 20s and a lot of school resources have dropped off but they're not fully fledged into careers and stuff yet so they don't have resources how do we reach those people and i'm sitting here in this army space where people are just doing these kinds of interventions and these support systems they're building them naturally organically they're building them for the grassroots like ground up and the folks doing this digital mental health work, it's like, it would be a dream come true for them to see this kind of thing come to fruition, right? And they could never replicate this. And so my point is, this is out in the world already happening. These people are already doing this work. So why can't we just celebrate that and highlight that and give the support to keep doing that kind of work? And that's my driver as somebody who's doing research in this space. And it's such a different attitude than we're seeing with a lot of these other papers and these other the these other researchers who also see the numbers. They also see the quote unquote potential, but they see it as something to exploit. They see it as something to mine and then walk away from. And without any thought to consequence or harm that is being done to these communities. Just no thought. Because I guess if it's just a hobby community and they're just points of data, then I guess no harm can be done to them. I don't know what it is, like why people don't realize that what they're doing is actually harmful to real life people who are out trying to live their lives. But it's really, I get really angry when I think about it. So that's where I'm at. <laughs> I share your anger. I think it, just to talk about the misogyny point again, it boils down to misogyny and how the fandom is viewed as a victim yeah. and viewed as helpless and yeah. also viewed as invisible. They dismiss how these communities people feel and they want to exploit it. It's like how, to talk about this too, we're both women and we both can relate to it. Like how women's bodies are exploited. Yeah. And how yeah. women's bodies are exploited in every single aspect of life. And even yeah. in fandom, they're exploited. Yeah. Where armies labor and our work 
that we have put into the fandom is trying to be exploited by people. And we are a majority female community, by the way. And I can say that very confidently. Yes. That we are a majority female community. That yes. our, it, it, once again, is a is like a, is an aspect of the patriarchy, just exploiting the labor and love of women to raise up institutions that, and like uphel- uphold institutions like academia uh, once again. And we need to talk about that more. And that's why we're doing this podcast. We need to talk about it more. We need to be able to connect those dots so that way people can see very clearly armies and fandoms, just fandom culture at large, not being taken seriously, is a product of the patriarchy that is still actively trying to exploit women. Armies are exploited constantly for clout. Oh my god, constantly. (laughs) Like from people who have worked with BTS, like collaborative BTS, people who have never collaborated with BTS. There, remember that random JLo cover of Dynamite? Or was it Butter? I genuinely can't remember, but she like randomly covered Dynamite or Butter. And it was just the weirdest thing in the world. And it came out of the blue. I didn't know what she was doing. <laughs> I and don't people, remember that, but wow. <laughs> yeah. And then and people saying happy birthday to the members on the member's birthday, but never talking about the member's music or anything. They just say happy birthday because right. they see it trending and they yeah. know that they'll get some likes if we if they tweet it out. Right. Armies will find it and like it and whatever. And ARMY, as a majority female group of people, I don't even want to say the word females, whatever. Just majority woman yeah. group of people. We are exploited constantly. And that is because once again, of patriarchy. Oh my god. Revolutionary we have the dots. <laughs> we have. It's just, and also to talk about this as well, research itself is exploitive. It, it's not just, we're talking about this in the aspect of K-pop, but research exploitation is a larger problem in academia. Oh, it's a huge problem. It's just a problem in general. I have worked with many communities. In fact, almost every community I have ever worked with since starting grad school has been a community that has in some way or another been exploited by other researchers. So I've always come into community spaces and been like, hey, I'm a researcher. And they're like, there's the door because we hate all of you. That has just been the my pattern anyway. And so doing reparative bridge building work has always been the first thing I've had to do entering community spaces where I want to do research because there's just this general... And this goes back, there's a whole history of academia and research and exploiting especially marginalized people, but exploiting people in general. There's a reason we have whole institutional review boards for ethics now, because researchers just used to do whatever they wanted to exploit the people. But in more current times, we have, we're in this moment, we're seeing this like happening in real time with data scraping and kind of the open access free for all that is happening with people just taking all the data from the internet, turning it into AI and into these kind of algorithmic machines and using that to their own fun and profit and without anyone's consent. So we're seeing how this is all coming to a head in a really obvious kind of explicit way. But research, especially I have seen it over and over again in the last decade, is researchers coming into a space like Twitter, seeing a community that's doing numbers or something is trending or whatever is going on, and then jumping in and being like, oh, this is a cool thing. Let me scrape all the hashtag. Let me get all the data for this trend. Or let me capture the timestamps between this month and that month and get all the data from there. And then I'm going to run my machine learning on it and I'm going to do this analysis. And sometimes they'll do some kind of deeper qualitative analysis, but mostly they're just like going to crunch numbers and do some language processing mojo, whatever. They're going to do these things and then they're going to make statements about how the army community as a whole has this thing going on because of this specific hashtag or whatever it is. And then never doing anything else with the community, not having any context or any clue of what's going on, right? But I've seen this over and over again, and it's led to some really terrible things just in other communities, not just this one. I've seen it a lot in mental health, where people try to predict mental illness based on how people are tweeting. I've seen how 
researchers have taken tweets, put them into a published paper, and then had the community see that without ever knowing those tweets were taken in the first place, had the community see that in this published paper and finding out that their stuff was taken out of context without their consent. And it's just, it's really bad ethically. It's just really bad practice. And partly it makes sense that researchers are coming in and doing this to ARMY too, because they do it everywhere. And that's just, and especially because ARMY is so big and especially because it does these kinds of numbers and has these interesting things going on, we're going to see people coming in and doing that. But the problem is then the few of us who are trying to do legitimate research and trying to actually help the community and say interesting, nuanced things about the community are left to rebuild all these bridges because these other academics have been really bad at their jobs basically. and they've burned every bridge and they've just been the worst imaginable oh my god i can't but one bright light is us and here we are <laughs> we're trying our best but I guess like with this whole conversation about community too, Kate, what do you think it means to do community-based research and do it well? So for me, community-based research is, I have a certain set of expertise. I have been trained to be able to do certain things. In, in my case, I have been trained to be able to take lots of different points of data and different kinds of data and tell a story about them. So I, part of what I've been trained to do is to be able to tell stories. So part of my job as a community-based researcher is to tell those stories. So to say, to be able to tell the story of, and I've done this in a paper already where all the different ways ARMY plays online all the different ways in which we engage in playful behavior and kind of the magic that happens when we have these playful moments. So tell those stories, tell the stories of how we play and why it matters. So that's part of my job as community-based researcher. And then I also happen to have an expertise in both knowing what is technologically available and possible especially from the point of view of someone who's thinking about misfitting and access, thinking about what are all the kind of potentials that could happen with technology, and then also having to have a lab full of students who can build things for me. So I have this expertise in then being able to not only tell the stories of the community and be able to tell the stories of what the community needs and wants, but also give them some of those things. So that's my different pieces as a community-based researcher. But all of it comes back to, it's driven by the community, it's supported by the community. And the day that the community decides they don't need this or want this, then I have to change jobs. I'm doing this based on what the community needs and what they're asking for. The last point you made was very interesting. Does ARMY need research? Does ARMY need academia? No. Not really. They don't need it. They needs us as well <laughs> as armies. <laughs> I don't think we need academia, but I think it's just another avenue for us to speak. Yeah, I think that, I, and that is like a very complicated question in reality. Does anyone need research? Maybe I not. obviously think I obviously think the answer should be yes, but <laughs> this is literally my employment. But I understand the like reaction to be like, no, we don't want that here because so many bad things can happen. The potential for harm is so great that I understand the reflex to be like, no, we don't want that here. But I also, as somebody speaking from the other side of the desk, literally, I know the potential for research can do for communities. And I know that if we just shut research down entirely and say, we don't want any research here because of the potential harms and because of X, Y, and Z researchers who have done really shitty work. If we shut the door entirely because of them, they've won. So there's that. And I hate it when the bad guy wins, but also then we're losing the opportunity for there to be change and for there to be 
papers that negate those bad papers. Because let's be real. If we said, hey, you bad intentioned researcher, don't take our data anymore. We don't want you to exploit us. Stop writing papers about it. They are going to ignore us because they didn't hear us in the first place. They don't understand. They're they're literally not listening to us. That's the whole point of this podcast. But so if we ask them to stop, they're not going to stop. And the journals are not going to stop publishing their work. It's still going to go and be out there. And so for me, I am offering the counter publication. I'm offering the counter argument to what these people are saying. And I feel that at least that maybe that has some value because yes, having research papers in a journal or a conference or whatever is for the average general person, that means not a lot, but our legislatures, our government, our technologists, the companies building the platforms that we are literally living our lives on right now, they all read these research papers. They all get, they all go to the Kai conference and find out what the latest and greatest research is going on. And they bring that back to their companies and they use it in their white papers for making memos about whatever legislature is up next. Like these things trickle down and perpetuate out into society and do eventually shape stuff. It takes a long time, but they do eventually shape stuff. So the question is for our, and maybe it doesn't matter to us as an army community right now in 10, 20, 50 years, do we want people looking back and only having a record of the exploitative capitalist research that was done in the space? Or do we want to have a record of the stuff that is actually meaningful and the things that the community actually contributed to the world? I want the latter. <laughs> and also with you saying all of this i'm hearing that we need to make counter publications for every single bad academic paper ever made oh good lord no i don't think we need to it's certainly not a one for one no i'm I down do though think, i yeah i do think that there's something to be said for having a really quality meaningful counterattack. and i do also think that there are ways for us to combat this without academic publications. One of the great things about doing work as a member researcher and like this podcast is an example of this is we can get the word out and we have the means and the resources to educate and spread the word and create these other avenues of telling these stories. And so that's also part of the exciting thing about being a member researcher and being in this space we can do these other things that don't who cares if they have academic clout but they have meaning to the community which is also something that the other researchers often lack is they don't turn it around and give the work back to the community like they should be doing but we do and that's why we're here (laughs) doing great work hanging out doing army-based research because we're armies first researchers second yeah and that's the tea honestly (laughs) any final thoughts kate final thoughts this was a fun episode to record because obviously it's literally my job to be thinking about these things and i guess it's not literally my job because clearly there's lots of academics out there that don't do any of this and they are still employed anyway that that was a depressing thought Okay. But yes, but other than that, this was fun because I, this is stuff that I think about a lot and I spend a lot of time feeling angry and frustrated and tired because I feel like I'm constantly fighting these battles with, in my academic community, within certain subsets of army and it's nice to be able to lay some of this stuff out on the table and be able to just be like, this is the actual landscape and here we are trying to survive it. And I'm hoping that not just survive, but I'm hoping that in some way we are the, maybe the first, maybe the like first wave here of people subverting some of the academic research context and trying to shift how we talk about fandoms, how we talk about army how we publish things how we 
work with communities, all of these things that have a lot bigger, broader implications beyond just our little bubble of talking about army. Like these are implications that could ripple out to a lot of the, of academia more broadly. And I think that is the thing that keeps me going and keeps me doing this work. And so that's why I'm here still. <laughs> and we're grateful that you're here. <laughs> and to just kind of add on to that as well, I think it's amazing that we have the skills to do all of this as well. Because yeah. like how we talked about earlier, how ARMY is viewed as this helpless thing. Right. We're not helpless. Obviously not. We, can, we have the skills. You have so much knowledge, Kate, to combat a lot of these things that you're seeing in academia. And even explain these things too. Because even before we had this conversation, I was very much thinking, yeah, a lot of fandoms are self-sufficient and don't really see academia as a bonus or an add-on to their community. And a lot of times academics, when they engage with their community, they're not even doing academia about the community. They're just, ac they're academic, but they're engaged with the community on the side right. to that. But to choose to be a member researcher and choose to be involved in the community and care about the community and, and knowing like the long-term implications of the research that you do as well, I think is really powerful. And I'm glad that we're here today to do this podcast and to do these things. Because even us being able to entertain the idea of making this podcast as well, mm -hmm. it, it very much is because we have the ability to. Yeah. I know how to edit things. I can edit audio, video. I do a lot of social media and marketing stuff as well. I know how to do that. I do graphic design. I do all of that. And, and I know how to talk. So here we are. Very slay. <laughs> Downplay yourself, Kate. You also do all the descriptions. And the social media actual that's post true. descriptions. Yeah, that's true. That's Don't true. downplay it, Kate. <laughs> Don't downplay it. <laughs> but yeah, we all of our skills have culm culminated here together for yeah. us to do this and to start something. Very much. I I talk about this with my one of my Twitter friends a lot. But we're the BTS generation. We're starting a movement. It's not just the way of BTS. It's the BTS movement yeah. because right now I'm seeing a lot of my mutuals, a lot of my army friends who are growing up, who are going into the professional field. Like one of my best friends on army Twitter, she works in finance in fortune for fortune 500 companies. And she's, you know, she's an army and she's pushing it as an army. And we have all these armies and professional fields and growing and learning and loving BTS. And all of us together, we are the BTS movement. We are the future. And we're going to go into, really, I really truly believe in the next 10, 15, 20 years, Kate, there's going to be a lot of change directly because of the work that armies do. We, we are only starting to feel it now. You know all of the McDonald's advertising for BTS from yeah. an army? There's so many people this happened recently as well. There was someone on Twitter who got hired for Calvin Klein, the Calvin Klein marketing team. And they posted it on Twitter to celebrate it. And I was like, ooh, armies are everywhere. We are we everywhere. are everywhere. And soon the whole world will be Bora blooded. Let it be known. <laughs> <laughs> now some research could come along and take that sentence out of context and we're going to be in trouble. Yeah, they're gonna be like, they're starting a cult. <laughs> He's crazy. I'm brainwashed. Take me to your leader. Anyway, yeah, that's my final thoughts. We are the BTS movement. All right, everyone. We're gonna wrap this episode up because it's been well over an hour. Take care of yourself. Have a good day. And remember to stream BTS. Yes. Stream BTS. Go stream and stream more and then stream before you go to bed okay bye, <laughs> bye.